So welcome, my name's Hazel Clark. I'm delighted to see you all here, particularly this weekend, which is a busy one for everyone before the holidays. So really pleased you're here. Just a couple of um, housekeeping things. Obviously, if you can turn off your cell phones or anything else that will make a noise, whatever that might be. The um, restrooms are outside. Actually, it points to the Performing Arts Library, but don't be confused by that. The restrooms are also down that corridor. And also there's tea, coffee, snacks, water. Um, we won't have a break during the after. Oh, OK. Toilets. I just announced the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> toilets are outside. Head towards the Performing Arts Library. Um, tea and coffee and snacks and water is available for everyone. We're not having a break during the presentations, but feel free to get up and you know help yourselves. Um, and please turn off your cell phones and please speak loudly. That's a good reminder. Thank you, Villas. So um, just to give you a little bit of background on uh, what's brought us here today. So this symposium has been held to um, celebrate and to share a three-year investigation, which we've been doing here at Parsons, into the work of Geraldine Stutz at Henry Bendel's. And that was actually spanning a period from 1957 to 1986 and we'll be sharing those findings towards the end of the symposium. But also, um, we wanted to recognize this work, but also to recognize other projects, other research projects that have been exploring the work of under-recognized women, or we feel under-recognized, who were key to the development of um, business um, and creativity in New York fashion in the 20th century, but not just those women who we know as designers, but also those women who were working in very significant areas, particularly promotion and retail. So um, we want to celebrate the research that's been going on and hopefully encourage and stimulate new work in the future in, in these subjects and in this area. And I think relatively New York fashion in its many aspects remains somewhat under research, and certainly in comparison, say, to what we know about London or about Paris. Um, fashion research also tends, as I've just said, to logically focus on the work of designers. But actually, as we know, um, and I know, you know many of you in the, the room are experts, from the beginning of fashion in New York, following you know, the start of the garment district in the Lower East Side, you know, moving up to um, the establishment of department stores in Manhattan, certainly retail and promotion have been very significant to this city's fashion identity in particular, so in my view at least. And yet, less is known about this area of fashion, I think, and certainly the fact that its development, as we'll hear this afternoon, was um, reliant significantly on um, some very key women in the 20th century. Some of those women have been subject of academic studies, as we know, particularly the fashion designer and critic Elizabeth Hawes, Sophie Gimbel, the fashion designer for Saks Fifth Avenue, and I'm delighted that Beth Dinkoff's joining us today, when she was fundamental in some of that research. Also, the fashion merchandiser Estelle Hamburger. Some of these women were also involved in the influential fashion group that was begun in 1931 to professionalize the roles of women within the fashion industry and to assert the importance of fashion within the wider social, cultural, and economic sphere. So our work on Geraldine Stutz is um, intending to place her alongside these women and to recognize the role she played in transforming Henry Bendel's from a carriage retailer in decline to a chic emporium of designer brands in the 1960s and for advancing the career of important American fashion designers, including Stephen Burroughs, Perry Ellis, Mary McFadden, Holly Harp, and Ralph Lauren, and as I say, more of that later. But during our research, we've also had the, the pleasure of getting to know not just other um, investigations, but also the, the researchers involved in those projects um, into women who were making similar key contributions to New York fashion retail, including Hortense Odlum and Mir uh, Mildred Custon at Bonwit Teller, the subject of Michael Mamp's uh, presentation today, and also learning about Stephanie Amarian's work on Dorothy Shaver at Lord & Taylor. 
So I'm really pleased now to invite our next speaker, Stephanie Marion, who's come from the West Coast to New York Falls. So thank you for doing that. She's uh, assistant professor of history at Santa Monica College in, in Los Angeles. She received her PhD in history from UCLA for her dissertation, Fashioning a Female Executive, Dorothy Shaver and the Business of American Style, 1893 to 1959. She's published on consumption history from the 1920s to 1960, and is going to add more of that particular perspective today. So I'm really delighted to introduce Stephanie to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I was really honored to be asked to join you all. Um, I have uh, presented my work on Dorothy Shaver to various historian people who don't usually know anything about fashion. So now I'm a little uh, nervous to be speaking uh, to all you fashion people who know much more than I do about the subject. Um, reading Carolyn's book was one of my uh, key entry points into the topic. Um, I'm going to talk to you about basically my dissertation research um, for uh, my work on Dorothy Shaver. I got my PhD from UCLA in 2011. Um, and uh, my path to Shaver, I'm going to explain, because it was not at all clear that I was going to write a dissertation on this woman. Um, so we'll see how I got there. I'm going to tell you a little bit of her biography. And then um, the, the two key pieces that I pulled out of her, um, her career is the importance of modern art for her throughout her career, really. Um, and how that, I argue, is really what led to her work to promote American design. Um, and so many of the, the American designers that we saw in the last presentation were um, people that Shaver supported. And then for me, the really interesting thing I found about her was her work on uh, her civic mindedness, if you will. Um, she really saw both herself and her store as uh, public citizens. And so the thing I'm gonna talk about is her, her um, creation of the American Design Awards, which lasted from 1938 to 1958, um, which is the year before she died. And then last but not least, um, I was gonna point to uh, where we can go in the future, which we got to a little bit um, in the last presentation as well. So uh, there she is in her office, her very modernist office from the 1930s on the left, um, and then in her executive office that, as far as I understand, is still there on the ninth floor uh, in the Lord & Taylor building. Um, I had ended my dissertation with it, it works actually quite nicely because at the time when I was finishing, Jane Elfers, a woman, was CEO of Lord & Taylor, and then they, I found a picture of her with Dorothy in the background um, to use. Uh, she has been fired since then, so it's good that I, that I finished when I did. Um, so I don't know if the portrait of Dorothy is still in the ninth floor office. Um, so if, if I was doing my dissertation on women's history, consumption history, it would seem quite clear to work on Dorothy Shaver, but I didn't know who she was when I first started in graduate school about 10 years ago. Instead, um, I was reading all the books on the right side. Um, I was really interested in consumer history, particular the, particularly the connections between um, consumption in American society and culture and national identity. So the ways in which um, consuming becomes something that is typically American and our entire really um, government apparatus, everything is pushing us towards that. Um, and yet in learning about fashion, I was also really fascinated about the politics of fashion, um, the gender politics of fashion, but then even the nationalistic politics of fashion. Um, so Nazi chic is fascinating. Um, fashion East is great, and fashion under fascism, like the ways in which governments are really actively trying to use fashion for political ends. Um, so I'm trying, I was trying to figure out how can I get into uh, these two things, and um, I came across the Hubble skirt, which some of you may know about, um, and I was fascinated by this thing. It, it seems so interesting, um, and every time I tell historians about the Hubble skirt, they're always like, 
they just can't understand, think it's hilarious. Um, because I was finding all these newspaper reports about um, women actually falling down and um, suing Pennsylvania Railroad for damages and injuries that they sustained um, because they fell down on the railroad while wearing a hobble skirt and all of these um, cultural authorities from the Pope to you know uh, church leaders, business leaders, this outcry about this fashion that is this design of the fashion revolution at the time. So then I found out about Edward Bach, the longtime editor of Ladies Home Journal, who's this very kind of conservative cultural figure. And um, he then, in reaction to the Hubble skirt, begins a uh, design competition. So he's going to try to encourage American designers, homegrown American designers, with this competition, American fashions for American women, he calls it. You need to be drawing on typically American things. So one woman designs a hat with a cotton ball on it. Another woman um, uses the American Beauty rose. One woman says she drew inspiration from a Whistler painting, like these very kind of derivative, obvious things. Um, and then I found Morris de Camp Crawford of Women's Wear Daily in the uh, contest that he was sponsoring. And then he was working also with the Natural History Museum. He was a friend of Stuart Collins at the Brooklyn Museum, really trying to actively get American designers into the museums using archival artifacts. Um, but all kind of looking to the past for inspiration, like how can we create American fashion? Um, then, of course, reading about Dorothy Shaver, well, when does American fashion really come? And it's this modern thing. It's forward looking, it's embracing the changes about gender, whereas Bach is very um, against that. So that's what I was gonna write my dissertation on. And then I had my oral exams and my advisor said, well, you don't know much about Dorothy Shaver, you know about these guys, start with her, go to the archives in DC and see what you find. So I did that. And uh, from the archives there, I found, well, of course this woman deserves a dissertation. She deserves multiple books, which don't actually exist. Um, people have studied her, but really there's not that much out there, even though she is, um, of course, within fashion very well, is very well known. The to historians is like somewhat well known. The Archive Center at the National Museum um, of American History is the uh, collection that her sister created in the 70s. Um, from what I understand, Dorothy died suddenly of a stroke in 1959. They boxed up her office, sent it to her sister, and then the sister um, donated it thanks to Claudia Kidwell at the um, Smithsonian who got her to do it. The Schlesinger Library for Women's History at Harvard also has a very small collection. Literally, it's just one box. Um, I felt compelled to go to see everything, but I um, probably didn't need to, per se. Um, and that, interestingly, Shaver had started herself during her lifetime, kind of foreseeing this. Um, the, the collection at the Archives Center is extensive, but it is somewhat um, one-sided, if we will. There's a lot of clippings. It was like, uh, it was Elsie's scrapbook, and literally you can see the black construction paper, like from where they ripped the things out and put them into the folder. Um, there's photographs, a lot of correspondence, so I used a lot of that. Um, recordings of the Design Awards show, and that was really fun, because I got, I got to actually hear Shaver's voice. And um, very distinct, like 1940s, 1950s way of speaking, that very kind of proper, affected speech. Even though she was from the South, I kind of expected her to have a little bit of a Southern drawl, but um, nothing of that sort. And then there is an oral history with her sister, Elsie, that's absolutely fabulous. Um, that woman's a firecracker. <laughs> and unfortunately, though, it only lasts about an hour. And so, um, I faced some real challenges. You know, the, a lot of the people who knew her are gone at this point. Um, I tried to get into Lord and Taylor, and they said no. Uh, instead, they sent me a book. <laughs> they said, "Sorry, we don't have anything," except that they do actually have things. And so, um, I have recently found out this is happening now. Um, 
that FIT Special Collections is creating a new archive. Um, a woman I know who works there says there are business records. I have not seen them. I'm not quite sure what's there, but um, someone should go and look at them <laughs> and see. So that presents some real challenges. And so I had to really kind of look, use what was there and let the, the sources guide me. But the problem is after spending two years with this woman, there's still so much that I don't know. And I think that's really why there hasn't been a formative narrative biography about her done yet. Um, and it's not gonna be me that does it either because I don't think the sources are there. I don't know much at all about her private life. Um, she lived her entire adult life with her sister. Uh, this woman here, Elsie, I mentioned before, there they are, the Shaver sisters. A um, little bit younger in the 40s and then in the 50s. And Elsie was an artist. I think that's absolutely foundational for this importance of art in Shaver's life. Um, they lived together, neither married and had this happy little life. And in um, articles about Shaver's career, literally they painted in this very gendered way where Dorothy is working the man's job, going out, earning this six-figure salary, and literally coming home to this wife-type figure who has decorated the apartment and manages the two maids that they employ. Um, that sort of thing, but I really don't know the nature, the full nature of their relationship. Obviously, I know nothing about Dorothy's romantic life, if there was, anything about her sexuality, nothing like that. Um, and then I didn't have the business records. So me as a historian, and I, I do work in business history, that's kind of the first thing I would want to know. And so I don't have memos, like what was her management style then? Who were her key figures that were supporting her or or um, holding her back. And then uh, lastly, she in these articles about her career will be credited in these ways about these amazing promotions, you know? But it's always so one-sided. It's like clearly it's this one woman who's founding all these things. There clearly must have been other people, but I just don't know. And so um, there are some real challenges with these types of sources. And so, um, what I did is I wanted to ask myself, answer the question of, well, how did she do it then? So in uh, the early 2000s, Harvard Business School identified the thousand greatest business leaders of like titans of American capitalism of the 20th century. And out of that thousand, 39 were women. Um, Dorothy made the list, as did uh, Beatrice Auerbach of G. Fox and Company, which is in uh, Connecticut, I believe, Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and that's it. And so it's like, OK, this is the first woman who works her way up the corporate ladder, they say, before the 1980s. Well, what was the key to her success? So in looking at the sources, what I argued in my dissertation is that it's these um, two things. Number one is what I call social, uh, excuse me, cultural capital. And that's basically her art and fashion knowledge. And that's not specific to her. That's something that we saw with Carolyn that's allowing all of these women. It's something that businessmen see as this clear way to make this money. And yet they don't know how to harness the power of fashion. I found an annual report from Associated Dry Goods Corporation, which held Lord & Taylor. Um, so I was at the UC Berkeley Business School looking at these annual reports. And in 1937, they're saying, like, fashion is this thing that's going to make us all this money. But we're not quite sure. It's this mystery. Like, how do we harness it? And so it's going to be women that have that knowledge and power about fashion and then also how to market to women. So that's something that I argued that Dorothy really had. And then in addition to that, she was really good at building up her social capital and then deploying it in ways that's going to build up her own career and also that of her store. Um, and that's what I was reconstructing from her correspondence. You know, and certainly if the sources had been different, I might have thought different things, but, but this is what I really argued. Allowed her to create this reputation for herself, but also the store. And for so long, the two were very much intertwined. Um, that they're tastemakers. You go to Lord & Taylor because you know that it's going to be this great service experience, this um, taste. It's not necessarily the highest class, but, but you go there because you're going to also be delighted in terms of your cons 
consumption experience. And yet at the same time, you're also shopping at a store that you know um, cares about you and cares about the community and the world even at large. Then Shaver had this very internationalist um, outlook. Um, little biography. She was born in um, what I assume is mostly rural Arkansas. Myself, I've never been to Arkansas at all, not, let alone center point. Um, it's outside of, sometimes she's said to be from Texarkana. Other times it's said she's from Mina, but that's center point. Um, Little Rock's all the way over there. The family was pretty middle class for a while. Uh, her father was a judge. Um, grandparents, one here, a paternal grandparent, was a colonel in the Confederate Army. Um, another one, the mother's father was a newspaper editor, I believe. So they're pretty big fish out in rural Arkansas. Um, and again, though, Elsie, I think, is the real firecracker. And I really wanted, I would have loved to meet that woman. Because at 17, she wants to go to art school in Chicago. So from Arkansas, she goes up to Chicago needs a chaperone, and so Dorothy uh, comes with her. Dorothy's taking classes in, at University of Chicago. Elsie, um, and that quote is from her oral history, where she says, I, I, went, I had a mop of hair and 90 pounds, and I set off for Chicago in the 1910s. Um, they're living there. Again, I don't know much about that. And then uh, Elsie sells these drawings that she's made to Marshall Fields, makes this money, and then she claimed Dorothy convinced them to use the money to buy supposedly first class train tickets to New York, one way tickets, and they're going to strike out to New York and, uh, and make it. I don't know exactly when that is, um, and as a historian, I really hate that. <laughs> I want to be able to tell you exactly when, uh, but I don't have documents. I found them in the 1920 census living in New York. Um, the census, though, did not say that she was yet working at Lord and Taylor. Um, the story of how she gets to Lord and Taylor is something then that's repeated as a trope in many of her um, uh, career articles later on. And um, while she did work her way up the corporate ladder, that social capital was absolutely key. Because, hey, guess what? Second cousin once removed was the president of Lord and Taylor, Samuel Rayburn. Um, I don't think they had a close relationship. I didn't find any correspondence in the archives with between her and Rayburn. Um, one would expect that. So I don't really see him as a mentor figure in her life, and yet this, you can't guess, discount this. This must be key. So the story is that the Shaver girl's mother asks Rayburn to check on them. They're these two young girls living in New York. He pays them a Sunday call, and Dorothy and Elsie have been uh, selling these dolls that Elsie made. Apparently there are these Cupai dolls that are popular in the 1920s. And so Dorothy says, hey, Elsie, you're an artist. You should make these dolls. I'll sell them. They've got this little side business. They're making this money. And so as Dorothy retold the story, I had a knack for timing and selling. And so Rayburn's about to leave. And she says, Elsie, show him your dolls. Rayburn's delighted by the dolls, starts selling the dolls at Lord & Taylor, and it's from there then that uh, Dorothy starts at the store. Again, I think that's around 1921. Some articles, though, say that she started there in 1924. It's also tricky because they both girls lied about their age. So in various reports, it'll totally have the wrong birth year. Um, but they can't escape the census where I found them. So. <laughs> Like sometimes it would say that they were twins, like they were born in the same year of 1897. Um, anyways, uh, one report said she started at the shoe department. Another said she started comparison shopping, which is basically like spying on other stores where you would go out and investigate secretly what the other stores were doing and try to replicate that. Dorothy tells a story that she says, why are we bothering spying on other people and just copying them? We should come up with our own ideas. And so um, she leads to, she argues we should have this centralized Bureau of Fashion and Decoration and that she's the head of. 1928, we'll see, is a really important year for her as well in terms of a, a modern art exhibition that she hosts. And then from there, you can see it's this upward trajectory. Always, though, in the 
in the fashion related aspects of the store. Right? So on the one hand, you do see women moving more and more into retail, even up to the top, and yet it is always in this gendered uh, sphere. You know, whereas Samuel Rayburn gets, had been president, he was a banker. I think he was even um, on the board of, of Federal Reserve Bank. Right? And so that's kind of the much more uh, male gendered career avenue. I want to talk now about the importance of art for Shaver and particularly modern art. I found this, you know, myself, but then I was really delighted to find this speech that she had given where she really cites the importance of art for, in her own life. She gave this speech at MoMA's uh, Good Design exhibition that, I, as, as I understand, was organized by the Ameses in 1950. And she told the audience, I'm not an artist. I'm a woman engaged in the business life of our community, yet most of whatever success I've achieved in business is due to art and its universal appeal. I have learned from dollar and cents returns that art is neither remote nor esoteric, nor removed from everyday life, but that the, it touches the heart and spirit of all people. There is no man who does not respond to some form of art. The form of art uh, may not be a painting or a piece of sculpture. It may be a chair or a dress or a window display. Only in these latter forms it isn't called art, it's called design. But to me, good design is simply art applied to living. And that was really her philosophy. When she's talking about art and I'm talking about her love of art, it encompasses everything. Um, and so she really tries to incorporate art into all aspects of the store. And this really key event in her career is a 1928 massive, I think it lasts for like six weeks, maybe even two months, showing of $125,000 of French Art Deco. Um, the two floors of the store are devoted to it. It's all of these rooms, um, these salons that you can go through and you see art um, uh, interiors as well as on the walls. This was the cover of the um, program that you would receive. And it's this huge, um, I, I have that quote, retail drama from, from one of her profiles later. This is something that 20 years later, people are still drawing uh, upon and saying, hey, this is, you know, this is what this woman does. But she's not the only one. Like, that's the thing. She didn't come up with this idea. Other stores are doing this as well. But she's doing it in this way that delights people and makes people remember. And it's this showmanship. That's what she's really known for. Um, but what I argue is that it's not just that she's showing, it's, it's OK, she's bringing in all this French modern art. But the reason why she was doing it is absolutely directly related to her later uh, promotions of American fashion. Because at the root of all of it was modernism. At the root of it is that she sees in modern art, that quote is from her on the top right, she sees in modern art a cheaper and easier way to attain beauty than the collection of genuine antiques. After all, this modern art is an expression of our particular age, the age of the young 20th century, and that's something that America, she says, will dominate, right? That this uh, modernism embodies American culture in this way. Um, and so I argue then that these thing, two things are directly connected. So that, then when we get to 1932 with the American Fashions for American Women promotion, this is not coming out of nowhere. It's not just a desperate attempt in the Depression to drum up sales, which is something Elizabeth Hawes accuses um, Lord and Taylor of even though she's one of the ones promoted. I never quite understand that. <laughs> um, so these are a couple ads from the 1932 promotion um, that for the, fr it's, it's often said that this is one of the first times that American designers are actually being named. So that there are these nameless people working behind the scenes that, that um, you know, people like Carolyn are trying to actually name, uh, but but Dorothy Shaver is, you know, picturing them and really showing them as artists. From that, of course, then you get to the very famous 1945 promotion of uh, the American look that um, has that life 
uh, profile in May of 1945, and um, we were talking about free digitized sources before. Google Books has digitized all of life. It's keyword searchable. It's amazing. So you can check these out for yourself. Um, and here's Shaver kind of presiding over. These are the models that, uh, some of the models that are in the photo shoot, those big artistic renderings that are the advertisements. And then one of those uh, women in fashion industry illustrator, Dorothy Hood, uh, working behind the scenes. Here's a few of those ads. And Lord and Taylor's ads were also said to be quite distinctive in terms of their uh, artistic quality. Again, she wanted the illustrators to sign them uh, if possible. And so art then is something that is this dominant force in her life. Uh, she's got connections to the Metropolitan Museum. She and other fashion women would actually give lectures there in the 1930s. Um, you as an aspiring fashion woman could go and listen. Eventually, she also did help found the Costume Institute, working with Eleanor Lambert on the uh, Party of the Year Gala to raise money, and then eventually elected to the, the Met's Board of Trustees, which is a pretty big deal in, in New York society. Um, and I believe she's the fourth woman at all in 1954 to be. And the other ones were all uh, very wealthy women. So kind of more from that upper crust of society, which of course, Shaver is wealthy, she's making good money, but she's not of that upper crust of society. All right, so the other point I wanted to talk about that was such a dominant part of her career, but also her life, um, was her philosophy about um, the store being a citizen. So she really envisioned her own uh, business life, but also her, her store, as being connected to consumers in this way. Um, and this situates the, her then within this group of what um, historians have called business liberals. So people who are working within the Roosevelt administration or uh, Democratic administration, kind of this uh, Keynesian, uh, consumer-sided eco economy, and very internationalist in scope as well. And this is something that was well known. So Vogue's profile of her praised her for her crusading citizenship, uh, looking beyond the store to the country. Uh, she has a quote that says, good business is also, uh, good citizenship is also good business. And she laid this out, I, I, there are some internal documents in the, um, the archive. She lays this out in the early 1950s to her employees. Not content with mere observation of this world outside our doors, we are active participants. As the world serves us as a catalyst, we must also serve the world. A store is a citizen too, and powerful can be its contribution. I feel that it is our responsibility to better the economic, cultural, and social conditions around us, not only for the community's well-being, but for ours as well. And again, she's not entirely unique in this, you know, like I'm studying these things and fascinated by these World War II uh, window displays, or they're using the window displays to, to talk about stuff that's going on in the war, but it's not just Lord and Taylor. But on the other hand, um, the way that Shaver does it, and the way then that she embeds herself within the larger um, business community that's also caring about this sort of stuff at the time is uh, a bit unique. I apologize, this is kind of dark, but it's from a brochure about the Lord and Taylor Awards so that you can hopefully see uh, the trajectory here. She starts the awards in 1938, and the point is supposed to be to be this new venue to support American design. And at first, in 1938, the, the designs are, the people honored are pretty straightforward. Um, you've got Nettie Rosenstein uh, being awarded for fashion design, Claire Potter, who uh, had already been promoted by Lord & Taylor. You've got uh, Dorothy Liebes, textile direct, uh, designer. Then you move on to kind of design writ large, right? Raymond, uh, I always say his name wrong, Lowy, yeah, Lowy. Raymond Lowy, who also had just uh, redone their third floor inside the store in modernistic fashion. Um, 
And then from there, you just keep getting this broader, broader, broader definition of design so that during the war, we're promoting designers of like aircraft <laughs> and bombs. And then after, in the 1950s, it's this huge international broad vision focused on design for living, she calls it. This is the cover of the uh, program for 1957. Um, and she honored Albert Einstein one year. I mean, it's just this really broad thing. And this uh, annual luncheon at the Waldorf Astoria was for 1,500 people. This is huge. You know, I have no idea what the actual expenditure that the store spent on it was, but it's got to be a lot of money. Um, and in terms of that social capital, she would send out letters to all these movers and shakers and ask them to lend their name to the sponsoring committee, always saying, you know, you don't have to attend. We just want, you know, this list of people. But a lot of people did actually go. And this guy, Tom Watson Sr., came every single year for a decade until he died from 1946 to 1956. He is the CEO of IBM. So I did not expect that. I had no idea that this woman in fashion history is also a really good friend of the CEO of IBM. And Tom Watson in business history is this scion. Like if you get an MBA, you learn case studies about Tom Watson. Um, he loved Dorothy Schaefer, though. And we'll get back to him in a second. What I found fascinating with that turn, that broadening in the 50s, is that she used the awards for pretty political purposes to support her own uh, liberal internationalist view. Um, it might not seem very controversial to be supporting the United Nations. I think we would agree on their, their vision, right? But in 1950, they were coming in for a lot of heavy criticism from uh, conservative voices, especially from the business community. Um, and the business community was really not a fan of the UN. Um, somebody like Hoover is publishing in the Wall Street Journal that the UN is uh, impotent and uh, holding America back from playing the true leadership role um, it should be playing. And so Dave Shaver, in supporting it, is really um, taking this opposite stand and saying, no, we've got to work with the international community. More explicitly in terms of politics, during the Cold War, she... Um, came out on the side of free speech and creativity. And in 1954, she was honored with, I think it's called the Brotherhood Award from the National Conference on Christians and Jews. Her award acceptance speech, she said, America draws its strength from diversity, diversity of opinion, of faith, of race, of cultures. When men prefer uniformity to diversity, they forsake individuality for conformity. They, can, they forfeit their freedom. And later in the speech, she says, an epidemic of conformity is sweeping through America, and particularly in business thought. And for her, then, as someone who cares so much about art and creativity, this is really a bad thing. She wants people to be individual thinkers. Um, so that seems pretty impressive, but then I look at the dates and literally she made that speech during the famed uh, media battle between Edward R. Murrow and Joseph McCarthy, and that speech came literally the same day that J. Robert Oppenheimer had lost his security clearance because of uh, accusations about his support of communism decades before. But Oppenheimer was on the sponsoring committee of the American Design Awards, and she didn't kick him off. She kept him on the committee for the next year. So even though he's had this uh, fall from grace, she, she stands beside him. In another way as well to show her liberal internationalist outlook, she was quite progressive on race. Um, and something that does kind of set her apart from uh, other people in fashion and other people in retail. Um, she was one of the first to hire black saleswomen during World War II. This was something that was quite um, unique at the time. And uh, something that Elsie Shaver, in her oral history, made, made sure to tell Claudia Kidwell about. Like she remembered decades later, you know, literally saying, my sister was the first woman to uh, give an African-American uh, job that wasn't pushing a broom around a store. 
and, and it was quite impressive. And in 1956 awards, she is broadly honoring American freedom. Her speech, though, is this like broad overview. How do we define freedom? Well, she goes all the way back to um, 17th century colonial period of Roger Williams and religious freedom. But she also comes all the way up to Brown versus Board of Education. Now, this is just two years after Brown and literally just a couple months before um, almost every single Southern congressman had signed on to the Southern Manifesto um, that I use actually in my own teaching with my students. And they're always like, what? <laughs> These guys literally call Brown a clear abuse of judicial power. This is a clear um, overstepping of, of this is what happens when men take you know, justice uh, into their hands. We need to fight back. Um, and so I would argue then that her honoring um, the Brown decision and honoring, uh, this is Ralph Bunch, who uh, helped uh, write the UN Declaration, the Declaration of Human Rights and was the first uh, American ambassador to the UN, um, standing beside him and really taking this progressive stand on, on race issues. The awards then also were this way for her to um, build up, but also cash in on her social capital. So people that she knew she could draw on to be sponsors, to attend. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt attended, and, and Shaver was, I don't know that I'd say friends with her, but certainly friendly with her. Um, Helen Rogers Reed, uh, pictured here, was the editor of the New York Herald Tribune, which of course Lord and Taylor had an advertising relationship with but then uh, she also developed a personal friendship with. I found this great document where uh, Dorothy Shaver had brought back from her last trip to Italy a pair of Ferragamo shoes for, for Helen Rogers Reed. Benefits of friendship with Lord Dorothy Shaver. Um, some of the people on the sponsoring committee by the 1950s that had grown to about 50 people um, by that period, and it's not really fashion people. It's people where Shaver is really trying to show, look, you know, we are movers and shakers in this larger um, government and business community. She got corporate sponsors, um, and again, then it's those friends. So Tom Watson would buy out a whole table, or Helen Rogers Reed would buy out a whole table at this event. Um, and the relationship between Watson and Shaver I found really fascinating because, again, I didn't find anything about Rayburn. So I expected that Rayburn would be this kind of mentor figure for her, this kind of fatherly, you know, I hired you, you're my cousin, and guiding her up the ladder, but I didn't really find anything about that. And instead, I found all these documents, correspondence, um, and in the IBM archives as well, between Shaver and Watson, and he really takes her under his wing. He even has all these uh, letters of introduction printed for her where she's going on a business trip after World War II, where he's gonna introduce her to various IBM operatives in these countries and be like, hey, maybe you need you know, some help in the business landscape which of course she doesn't <laughs> at all. But um, that's kind of you know these interesting relationships that I found. And he loves her so much that the 1955 show um, was literally a show where they had a stage production with music and a video screen. And it was all about um, New York history and how New York um, becomes this you know, great American city in uh, mid-century. And he's so impressed that he has this commemorative book made where he wrote to um, various retail figures like Bernie Gimbel to, to donate money. And then he has a thousand copies printed and he sends them out to various people. Um, and the money from that year went to the Museum of the City of New York. Um, and so in a larger sense then, um, I thought that this letter I found from this woman writer for the Dem department store Economist embodied what these um, award shows were doing for her. Uh, this woman wrote to Shaver in 1947 and said, it's obvious that this occasion certainly sells and resells Lord and Taylor as a great institution. So that certainly the, the you know, actual people that they're honoring and all of that is important, but it's also showing how Lord and Taylor is this, is this key institution in American life. And Dorothy Shaver, by, by um, her connection as well, is this great public figure. So last but not least, I wanted to point to then 
kind of the next steps. So I have been thinking about this myself. I have not made a lot of progress. I uh, teach five classes and 200 students. So <laughs> Uh, this is the book I would like to write. I'm not sure that it's ever going to happen. So someone else is, is more than welcome to write it. Um, but what I was thinking is that the, you know, my dissertation, it doesn't really lend itself to a book. So I've broken up pieces of it and I'm publishing a lot of articles from it. The book that I think should be written is about women in fashion. And there are so many of them, you know, so many that, that Carolyn pointed out. And then what I'm really interested in as well is within the retail sector, you've got people like Dorothy Shaver, or we're going to hear about um, Hortense Oldlum or Mildred Custon, for example. But what about the middle managers? What about all the women in between and the buyers we heard about? And the buying offices. Historians right now are very interested in transatlantic connections. We always want to think about transnational influences. And people have asked me at conferences, well, do you know about connections that she's got to Paris? You know, who are those Paris-based buyers or those Italian offices? And I've got a couple addresses, but not really much to follow up on. Um, I think we've brought up everybody here so far. Um, that's Helena Rubinstein as well. Uh, Virginia Pope, one of those fashion journalists. Um, Edith Head, I know we're focusing on New York, but I'm from California, so. <laughs> um, and for me, as I approach this book, if, if it happens, I would focus on the fashion group. I think they're really key in all of this. Also because I study Dorothy Shaver and she helped found it, so <laughs> I think she, it's quite important. Um, the Mary Elizabeth thing, that happens in, I believe, 1928. It, it's officially founded in 1931. Um, Here's kind of the founding figures of it. What I, why I think it's so important is to get at those middle managers because to join the fashion group, you did have to be a woman for most of its um, history. I think they changed that like in the 1970s or 80s. Someone else can correct me if I'm wrong. It does still exist today. Um, you may know more than me. I do know someone who works in fashion. I asked her, hey, do you know about the fashion group? She's like, I've never heard of that. So I don't know if it's really that big a deal or not anymore. They, their website claims they have 5,000 members around the world. Um, but what's interesting is in this period, you had to be a woman, you had to have a sponsor from the group, and you had to have three years of experience, and they later increased that to five. So they were really looking at established people. This was not for you know, entry-level people. Um, and those records are at the New York Public Library. I've gone through them. I was really trying to pay attention to Shaver, though, so I think um, one would want to go through them again. And as far as I know, there is not a book on the fashion group, so that's certainly an avenue for research. And the fashion group also points to these larger connections that I found with Shaver. So Eleanor Roosevelt, not often thought as a, as a fashion figure. Um, on the advisory council, spoke to the fashion group a couple of times, actively tried to get women in the fashion industry to support New Deal efforts during the Great Depression. Um, and a connection, I think, of why is that one of her good friends, this woman, June Hamilton Rhodes, um, was a member of the group and kind of is a connection. So there's these multi-leveled connections within the fashion industry, but then also without. This woman as well I'm fascinated by um, and spoke, I found her by, um, she had given a speech to the fashion group in the 1940s. She's this longtime democratic operative, a new dealer, goes on to become in 1950 the first woman assistant secretary of defense. Um, she, her connection is that her sister Claire Lang had worked in fashion, had worked for Dorothy Shaver, went on to Franklin Simon. Um, and so was a member of the fashion group. And so can then draw onto these network connections into the larger schema of uh, professional women. And um, right, so I was kind of start focusing on this one person and even from her I found all these connections within fashion but then also without. And then in a larger schema I think we need to think of women in fashion quite broadly, not just in terms of the jobs that they're doing, but the people that they're talking to, because fashion is so important in this period, and it's recognized as quite important and embedded into the larger cultural, um, social, and cult uh, government landscape in ways that maybe today we might think of as kind of separate. I mean, 
I don't really think of Anna Wintour as a political figure. Maybe I should. I don't know, right? But like in this period, that's really, really clear. Um, so I think that's that's it for me. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I mean, I think we've got to um, we've got to you know, commission for you to get the sabbaticals for the book. <laughs> the, book is, the book is just needed. I mean, you've made that point so well. It's all something about Shaver. I also think that um, I, I'm sure with FIT and Lord and Taylor, and others in the room are probably not. I think yeah, and more than me, I really don't know no, much. I think they've got the papers they were The students were even going to do an exhibition, which didn't happen, um, okay. as I recall. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's what we have. No, lots of notes. Cool. So I think I've seen the, 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 book. the book of the exhibition that Good. didn't happen. Yeah, so Good. That's, that's exciting. Anyway, questions, anyone? So I'm curious, um, I think in kind of the history of department stores, oftentimes we'll talk about Bonwitz and we'll talk about Henry Mendel, uh, but I feel like Lord Taylor is kind of the, the stepchild. Do you think it's because there's not as much information published, but I feel like not as many people necessarily consider Lord and Taylor in the history of the department store? Sort of hmm. I don't know that I think it was considered a stepchild. I mean, I haven't really, no, but I haven't really come across that. I mean, but certainly it's, they're, they're definitely not trying to hit the same kind of market as even a Bonwitz and certainly Henry Bendel or Sachs or Bergdorf. Like, she definitely is envisioning kind of a different class of consumer, um, you know, middle class, upper middle class, certainly a class above something like Macy's though, or Bloomingdale's in this period. So Lord and Taylor is kind of this this in between, um, and then another thing Shaver does uh, pioneer, I think, pretty well is the suburban branch store. So they start branching out into suburbia in the during the war or immediately afterwards into New Jersey and Connecticut and eventually Pennsylvania and whatnot. Kind of following her upper middle class consumer out to the suburbs. Um, yeah, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, this two points. I you really shouldn't be shocked that Tom Watson was a prey of Gordon Shavers. I just met his tailor. Tom really? Watson was someone who cared very much about his clothes. He had some bespoke suits. Huh. He bought his clothes at the best tailoring shop in New York City. And I would also say that I think, unfortunately, our field the fashion industry, is, as Hazel has said, is one of the uh, most complicated and rich industries in the United States. And it's filled with networking, institutions, social groups, and knowledge that's being traded. So that Dorothy is part of a very small but very rich world of people in New York who are in the fashion business. Mm -hmm. And to get some sense of all the interconnections and the, the concerns of all these people, you have all you have you need to, to to remember that women's wear daily was being produced every day of the week, telling all the events in the business. There are a million organizations and now that Ruth Fit Finley's fashion now at FIT, you can see from 1945, the events every day of the calendar in the fashion business in New York meant that, uh, that um, in a sense, we don't have a good history of department stores. We're, we're, we're just beginning to, to get what is was really going on. The, everybody's they're all involved with the government because the government's interested in promoting its, its industry here in New York City. So, mm -hmm. and the business leaders, the cultural leaders, it's part, part of New York society. So, mm -hmm. I'm just you know recommending people to look at some of these other uh, look at these other sources. And Ruth's calendar is going to pr provide. For me, it's been an absolute revelation, hmm. you know, that about uh, the interconnectedness of, of this industry. I'm not saying that she's an important, original, creative, perhaps genius in, in, of that group, 
-hmm. But um, um, it's nothing like other kinds of business, like yeah. like the car business. Yeah. And. Yeah, I mean, and I think those complications are why it's been so long in the making um, and, and not that much exists on it. I haven't encountered that source before, but I definitely love to see it. Um, I want to know more about the buyers. I feel like the buyers are kind of the key in this and, and really fascinate me. I had no idea until working on Shaver, I made a... Um, I made a so Ancestry.com allows you to search um, ship manifests. So I was able to track out how many times Shaver went to Europe. She was going to Europe multiple times a year. And she's not even the buyer. Um, yeah. I can't imagine that. I don't even come to New York three times a year on a plane that takes five hours, not a ship that takes a week. Right? And so and the, that lifestyle and what these guys are doing and, and the who they're working with, how just even the basics of how this system works, I feel like we don't even know fully. Um, there's just so much work to be done, and it is rather overwhelming, frankly, which is why I have not written my book yet. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions or comments? Oh, please. Yeah, I What I find so interesting about what I hear from her and what I gain from the calendars is that there's an interesting dichotomy about how the department stores and the industry was working on the, side, on the business side compared to the manufacturing side. So 7th Avenue is still very mom and pop and small and, and individually itemized. And it's interesting how you see here everything coming together on the parallel promotion, buying, communication side. And there's not a lot of research on that dichotomy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I really don't. I, I focus on Dorothy Shaver. I don't know that much about 7th Avenue's connection to Lord & Taylor. And even just the basics of, um, like we talked about, uh, before of uh, designers making clothes under the department store's labels, but then also the importing and how that's mixing together um, and how much of this is being bought and sold as opposed to others. And that's where I feel like we really need those business records um, and to be able to trace out those those connections. Yeah. Um, there's I, one book. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I have read something on 7th Avenue, but if anybody has books to, to, to read on the history of that, I would, I would love your reading list, because I found some stuff, but again, it's not that extensive. Um, so we'll have to talk later. Maybe one last question. Anyone has one? No? OK, thanks so much.